Um, we have a, a power lineup here of um, policy officials that cover uh, not only those two organizations, but issues beyond that. So um, I think we'll try to take advantage of their, uh, their great expertise here. Um, we're going to uh, let each of them make a few opening remarks, and then um, I'll ask them a few questions, and then I'll open the, the uh, floor uh, uh, to all of you. Um, so uh, let me just go down the line first, and I'm, I'm not going to do the full introductions because you have the biographies there, but uh, to my immediate left, your right, is uh, Mr. Shigehiro Tanaka, who is the Director General uh, for the Multilateral Trade System Department at the Ministry of e Economy, Trade, and Industry, uh, or METI, in Japan. Uh, Tanaka-san uh, has been in his job only a couple of months, I think, in this particular job, but he's a, a long experienced uh, expert in, in uh, a range of trade issues, uh, including APEC, which he's uh, worked on a couple of times, uh, most recently as the APEC senior official from METI uh, until, uh, until very recently. So, uh, so he is going to be able to talk about a lot of issues that um, will be of interest. Were you also the East Asia Summit senior economic official for METI, well, effectively? No, but, but, yeah, okay, so effectively, he was also very involved in the East Asia Summit, so I don't think that's mentioned in his biography. But um, uh, So Tanaka-san, we're delighted to have you. Next to him is uh, Bob Wong, uh, who is the uh, newly arrived uh, senior official uh, for APEC. But uh, Bob is a well-known uh, uh, figure, especially in this room, uh, in this building, because he uh, served here as a visiting fellow a couple of years ago uh, before he went out to Beijing to be the deputy chief of mission at our embassy in uh, Beijing. Uh, Bob is a longtime Asia hand um, at the State Department, and uh, we've worked together before, and I'm delighted to have him back in Washington and with us here at CSIS. Um, and then uh, next to uh, Bob is Eero Augereau, who is the Deputy Assistant USTR for APEC and Localization Barriers to Trade, which is, I think, the longest uh, title we have here today. Uh, but all very, Im and, and we, didn't even we didn't even spell out APEC, which, uh, um, which uh, would have made it even, even longer. But, uh, but all important uh, issues over there at, at USTR. She can talk. I'm actually interested. I hope she will talk about the localization issues in particular, because that's a sort of new um, function for Arrow and for a new area of focus for USTR. Um, I mean, it's been there for a long time, but as a particular fo area of focus. Um, Arrow and I worked very closely together um, when I was at the White House on the, uh, the U.S. APEC year in 2011, and I'm um, delighted to have her here with us to uh, talk about this year's APEC uh, summit and U.S. objectives there. Uh, and finally, uh, last but not least, Michael Kaplan, a former colleague of mine at the U.S. Treasury Department. He's still there. He's the director for South and Southeast Asia, and he's also the senior financial official um, in APEC. Uh, there is an APEC finance minister's process that uh, Michael is in charge of, and uh, he will talk to you about that. But Michael, I'm also going to uh, test him as well because uh, he, he follows uh, broader issues in the region, um, uh, including, of course, the macroeconomy, the macroeconomic and growth uh, situation in, in this part of the world. It's a, a subject of great interest uh, in uh, the international econ economic uh, circles these days. So, uh, so that's our panel. Uh, they're all terrific, and we'll bring a little bit different angle, each of them, to, uh, to this uh, conversation. Uh, so with no further ado, I'm going to let Tanaka-san begin. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, and I would like to thank uh, the CSIS for uh, hosting this meeting, and um, I'm very honored to, uh, to be here to speak before you. Um, as was introduced, uh, my present for portfolio does not necessarily focus on Asia, but since I was working on APEC and uh, ASEAN-related matters for some time, uh, I think I'll be speaking on this issue. Uh, I'll be uh, quite brief. But since uh, there are so many distinguished people who will be speaking on the APEC, uh, I think I'll rather uh, focus on the ASEAN side uh, when I speak, the ASEAN Plus processes, uh, including the East Asian Summit uh, in my, in my uh, presentation. Uh, first, uh, Japan has been a long and consistent supporter of the ASEAN integration. And uh, we see the notion of ASEAN centrality as a key in uh, approaching this uh, uh, Asian uh, architecture issue. Uh, we see the East Asian Summit and all the other ASEAN-related forums as a uh, forum which is necessary in achieving stability in the region. Uh, we see them as the, we see the, the main role of these forum as uh, being to minimize the economic impact of political and security uncertainties 
uh, in the region. Uh, although we know that uh, events in the South China Sea and other uh, disputes may have posed challenges. Uh, we think that the, the closeness of the security issues and the economic and the business uh, environment in the region uh, makes it absolutely necessary that we have these kind of uh, forums uh, in place. Uh, one question that uh, comes to my mind is uh, would the strengthening or dealing with the economic agenda with economic agendas, and these uh, forums will help alleviate uh, the tensions or, or, or increase uh, stability in the region. I think uh, our answer is, uh, is an unequivocal uh, yes. And I think the history of the East Asian Summit itself is proof uh, of this. Uh, if we see the agendas or what has been discussed in the past uh, East Asian Summit meetings, if I name some of the priority areas that they have identified uh, which uh, comes from, uh, which is uh, like uh, energy and environment, uh, finance, disaster management, uh, education, uh, uh, global health issues, pandemic diseases, and uh, as in connectivity. Well, uh, well, all sorts of economic and business related agendas. And of these, uh, first I would like to highlight the connectivity, uh, the agenda. Um, actually, this ASEAN connectivity agenda was added to the EAS uh, priority areas in 2011. Uh, in this context, uh, reference was made to uh, contributions from uh, ARIA, ERIA, uh, a short uh, abbreviation of uh, Economic Research Institute of ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, this is actually a uh, think tank that was established in 2008 in uh, Jakarta. And this is a very uh, important asset uh, for ASEAN, and it works basically as a think tank in providing the intellectual inputs, not only in the field, the field of economic policy, but on also other uh, uh, important uh, issues related to ASEAN integration. And they've been working very hard with the ASEAN uh, summit processes in coming up with uh, what they call the Comprehensive Asia Development Plans, or master plans on Asian uh, ASEAN uh, connectivity. And um, uh, on these issues, uh, what exactly is, do they mean by connectivity? Uh, there are three aspects. One is uh, physical connectivity, which basically talk is about the infrastructure side. And then comes the institutional connectivity, which is about mutually recognizing standards or providing single windows for, for uh, government regulations or achieving free flow of investment or uh, uh, service movements uh, throughout the region. And the third is the people-to-people -people connectivity. Uh, what they actually mean has been discussed in the ASEAN process uh, by several uh, ministerial meetings, but one of the, uh, the, the ministerial meetings, which is called the EAS uh, Economic Ministers Meeting, has just held their meeting in Brunei and has, a, a, has announced uh, to formalize uh, their process uh, to, uh, to, uh, to deal with these kind of issues. They've actually agreed to uh, d address issues uh, on the connectivity side and first, they have pointed out that they would like to uh, focus on the business connectivity, meaning uh, uh, a mere physical connectivity is not enough uh, to really raise the economic level of this region. And they, uh, by using the word business connectivity, their uh, intention is to uh, address uh, development of supporting industries or leading to a broad and stable supply chain network throughout this region. They also uh, are placing a lot of importance on, uh, on uh, an institutional connectivity, including on the regulatory cooperation, uh, which again is, of course, uh, will have a huge uh, business impact. Uh, the second thing that I would like to emphasize is uh, that these East Asian Summit processes and also the, all the Asian, ASEAN Plus processes have helped as a, has worked as a vehicle for promoting uh, economic integration in East Asia. Actually, they have worked uh, as an incubator for regional FTAs, as APEC has in relation to TPP. Uh, until 2011, uh, there were a huge discussion among the ASEAN Plus uh, forums as to w which way they should go, uh, mean, meaning uh, whether ASEAN Plus 6 route is better or ASEAN Plus 3 
uh, meaning ASEAN, Japan, Korea, and China only, uh, would, would suffice in terms of creating a new FTA. Finally, uh, the agreement was to formally launch what is now called an RCEP, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, which was agreed upon and, and formally launched in November uh, last year. Uh, of course, this is something that is, uh, in, in, a, in, in, a, in a sense, uh, competing, but also with TPP. But, uh, but on the other, we see it as more and more an uh, effort uh, that is needed to help each other, boost each other, and eventually uh, lead to a more uh, cohesive uh, uh, free trade area uh, throughout the Asia-Pacific. Uh, the situation for the RCEP is that since the formal launch last year, uh, they have had uh, several uh, uh, negotiating sessions, and their goal is to have a uh, conclusion by uh, 2015. And, uh, well, so that's uh, the other aspect of this uh, East Asian uh, corporations. And the third thing is that uh, I think one of the key goals of these uh, meetings is to uh, uh, keep on supporting the realization of the ASEAN economic community, uh, which also they share, they have the goal of achieving this by the year 2015. Uh, here again, it is very helpful and will may ensure that this process will continue to be healthy and provide a very stable very business environment by the involvement of the countries like the United States or Japan or the others. And I think that is another uh, very important aspect that we have to uh, look upon. Um, I would like to just br br briefly, uh, toward the end, uh, refer to some of the special features of the East Asian Summit. First, uh, this EAS is one of the few forums where Cambodia and Laos, or also Myanmar, are, are can be treated or dealt with in the multilateral context. Uh, so far, these countries are not yet members of APEC, for example. And also, uh, EAS is a forum which includes India as its partner. So, uh, uh, the, the role of engaging uh, India in the policy making in this region is also another very crucial role for the East Asian Summit uh, process. And when I compare the East Asian Summit process with the other forests, for example, uh, there is what they call, or what we call, the ASEAN Plus Three, and actually this forum still remains to be very active. Uh, with its own institutional mechanism. So uh, uh, although there are some overlapping areas that they deal with, uh, you also have to be mindful of the fact that there are still several competing uh, forums uh, in this region. But EAS is still the only forum in which India and China both play a very important role. And we see this as another added value of uh, the EAS process. And under EAS, although it's still a very young process, it is not as developed as APEC or other forums. Uh, it doesn't have so many ministerial meetings uh, as the others, uh, but also they do uh, hold back-to-back -back meetings of ministerials of different uh, configurations. And so my experience tells me that uh, uh, there are all sorts of way, ways to you know, uh, deal with these uh, settings in a more efficient manner. And I think that's uh, the kind of role that ES can play in terms of com contributing to this overall uh, uh, Asian uh, architecture, especially in light of the, the business or the economic perspective. Uh, I think I'll stop here for the initial presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanaka-san. That was very helpful, uh, especially to those folks who don't follow the, um, the EAS and, and RCEP uh, and the economic dimensions of EAS in particular, which isn't as big a focus here in Washington. I'm going to ask about that later. Um, Bob. Okay. Uh, thank you. As Matt said uh, in his introduction, I am newly arrived. Uh, in fact, I arrived last night. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I've been I've been I've been on this job. <laughs> I've been on this job for three weeks now, full weeks. But I just went on a, this whirlwind tour of Asia, back to uh, Tokyo and Bali and Jakarta and so on. It just arrived last night. So uh, if I say anything that doesn't make any sense, please. Uh, <laughs> Please just assume it was, uh, it was because of my just having arrived. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, let me just, since I'm very new at this, let me just give you a brief uh, comments about uh, how I see APEC in particular. Uh, Tanaka-san I met in Tokyo he had talked about ASEAN already. And let me just tell you a little bit about how I see APEC, uh, both in terms of its architecture 
uh, in terms of the sort of Asian region as well as in terms of its priorities. Uh, I have on my left, of course, Arrow from USTR, who's going to talk a lot about the, in details about the uh, trade and investment side of APAC. So I'll focus more on uh, other sides of APAC uh, uh, beyond, beyond that. Uh, I guess my first impression, what strikes me most about this job, uh, about APEC in particular, I guess, is the fact that, and this is really reinforced uh, to me on this trip, is about not so much about the breadth of APEC, which is, of course, as you know, you know, 50 percent of the GDP of the world, um, four continents, if you include Australia as a continent too, of course, and uh, four con it's, it's just very, very wide. Uh, f top three countries, in economies in the world, uh, and so on. But beyond that, what really strikes me, apart from the breadth, is the depth of uh, APEC, and I think what I would call the organic nature of APEC. Uh, depth, I mean, for example, there are about 200 uh, meetings every year, apparently, uh, in APEC. Uh, I just went to one of them, uh, two of them. <laughs> Uh, there are about 200 of them, and actually most of them are not the ones you think of. Yeah, most of them, most of you, of course, and, and most of the public look at this, the leaders' meeting where the presidents all arrive and wear different costumes, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then you, see, you, you might see some ministerials here or there, but really, actually I found out that obviously about 95% of them are actually at working levels of officials from 21 economies working with each other on a wide range of issues from health, food. I went to the Women in, in the Economy Forum, uh, anti-corruption, SMEs, and so on. So all of, it's the depth of the organization is such that you have, again, uh, the very deep-rooted foundation and habits of cooperation and working on different issues among these uh, different economies. And I think that's really quite impressive because it's partly an educational process, it's partly a relationship development process, and it's just a process of, of getting to work with each other on all these different issues. So, so I think the depth part is something I think is very important. The other one I mentioned is, of course, organic nature of APEC. By that I mean, uh, if you look at APEC when it started, in, I guess, officially in 89 and then 93 and on, all of the, most of these economies already had existing trade and investment ties. And, uh, and all APEC did, really, as it got them together, was really simply to institutionalize and to expand and deepen these ties and improve these ties. So it's organic in the sense that it's, it's, it's not an artificial creation where you have, I mean, G20 is fine, but you know, it's all from all over. You, you bring people together, countries together that really actually don't necessarily interact on a daily basis with each other. Whereas you have in, in APEC, the trade, the supply chain already established and when it was formed. In fact, by 1989, it was already quite a lot of this. And APEC simply means, is meant essentially to institutionalize these different ties and then deepen them and working further on them. And so I think from that perspective, this foundation is very sturdy because, again, that's why we have so much business uh, private sector involvement in it. I, I met at every stop with ABAC members in Japan, in Jakarta. This morning I met with our ABAC member, Bart Peterson, with Eli Lilly. So much economic interest because they already have these very practical ties that they, that they really do value a lot. And so APEC simply works to bring in the private sector with the public sector. And every single meeting we have, for example, the Leaders Week uh, coming up, will have an ABAC forum that, that essentially goes many, many days. You'll have the CEO summit, and then you'll have the leaders and then the ministers. So the, the organic nature of this organization is such that uh, it really does meet the very practical needs of business community throughout the 21 economies. So I think that's important to note that I think some organizations may not have. Now, uh, briefly on priorities, uh, I think clearly we still remain very much focused on the market opening, uh, trade and investment liberalization as the primary focus of, of uh, APEC and what it's trying to do. I think right now the, the attention may be on TPP. Um, I know TPP is not Exact, it's not really the APEC process anymore, but it came out of APEC members, the P4. And after and whenever it's completed, uh, I think the effort will be to try to expand it 
to other APEC members as well as uh, economies outside of APEC. So it's a very important uh, focus that we continue to emphasize, and um, and I think it come it came out of APEC partially because people got together to pe uh, and decided some some within APEC decided to move ahead of the others because APEC, as you know, all of you know, it's a consensus sort of organization. And so out of that, people decided to move ahead in terms of liberalizing trade, and they got together and, of course, moved towards TPP. Uh, and so I hope, and that, that will continue to be the focus for, year, for, I think, for many years to come in terms of its expansion and uh, into other members. Uh, apart from that, I think, um, you know, as, as I see it, at least uh, in terms of my own responsibilities, clearly you can open up the markets, you can lower tariffs, you can you could uh, do different things, but none of that is really effective unless you have the environment in which the opening can actually take effect. In other words, capacity building. You've got to have officials who know what they're doing. You've got to have customs officials. You've got to have health officials, uh, et cetera, who know what what to do. And so I think capacity building, from my perspective, is a, a very, very important part of what we do in APEC. Uh, not just opening, not just lowering tariffs, but actually getting people who are working level people who actually uh, uh, have to implement a lot of these policies know how to do it, sort of business facilitation issues. For example, you know, one of the big successes that uh, APEC had with Arrow and others last year was to actually finalize the EGS you know, the environmental goods and services list and so on. Uh, once you've done that, you've, you've targeted 2015 to complete it, then how do you actually implement it? How do you actually reduce the non-tariff barriers involved in the EGS uh, import-export trade? Well, you have to, we now, we now are then building a capacity, build, we're now doing a capacity building program to actually go to each of these economies to make sure that everybody understands what the agreement says, how to implement it, and actually get things done. So I think similarly, we're, I, I know that, um, that USTR and uh, we and are all working on the supply chain connectivity that um, Tanaka-san says also, you know, obviously is the focus of uh, ASEAN. And there again, we're trying to get, you know, I sort of, I went hat in hand to the, to, to the Japan, to Taiwan, um, uh, Taipei, Chinese Taipei representatives, to ask them to all support and co to contribute to a fund to actually deal with the various choke points that we've seen in terms of the supply chain throughout this uh, region. And again, that's capacity building. The last thing I'll say is that uh, I think there's going to be increasingly uh, greater focus on the sustainability issue, meaning how to sustain this growth, how to sustain trade and investment that's been opened up. And that involves, for example, uh, women in the economy, and which is a very valuable source of, um, uh, of growth for many economies. Or I think after this, next week, I go back out to the region and we'll be attending an anti-corruption and transparency workshop. And I think we're going to, in, in 2014, perhaps and on, we're going to start focusing on the legal framework within which all of these economies interact. As you know, we have problems throughout, you know, throughout uh, the region, in China, in uh, Indonesia, other places with corruption issues. And uh, so uh, we're going to start uh, in, in Bangkok with this, you know, with this act, uh, anti-corruption and transparency. We hopefully will, in 2014 in China, begin to focus more on this. And it's a very, very long-term process to sustain the social and legal environment that is needed to make business work. So I see my job as essentially rolling up my sleeves, nothing very dramatic, but really working on a lot of these issues of food security, um, women in the economy, uh, anti-corruption, legal issues, and so on. Uh, and I think that in the long term, uh, I know that, I guess I come from an academic background, and in some ways when I look at what APEC is doing, it's reminded me of the European coal and steel community that was uh, created in 1951 when I was born. So it's, I'm very old. Uh, <laughs> and, and then that was followed by the common, the common market in 58, and then eventually by the EU. So I see the integ integration part of it as quite an important achievement. And of course, focus now on economics, but in the long term, I think the impact of that on the region uh, will be tremendous. So thanks.
Thank you, Bob. Uh, that was a great overview, and I think um, you stressed the breadth and depth of, of APEC. I hope you haven't made the mistake that I made a couple years ago when I got back into APEC and asked for a, a chart that shows all of the working <laughs> groups and, and committees and other things of APEC, because it doesn't fit on an A4 piece of paper. No. It, you have to tape things together on the wall. <laughs> and it's easy to be cynical about that, but actually, I mean, I think just to emphasize the point, it really is unique that APEC has this ability to bring together uh, officials from customs agencies and health agencies and energy and, you know, agriculture agencies together at, at a working level to, to work and try to, you know, do the pick and shovel work of, of improving uh, uh, economic integration. And I don't think there's, I mean, I know there's no other organization in the world that does it and certainly not one that has the leader's political level above that to help drive that process. So mm -hmm. I think APEC is, is very important. But anyway, I didn't mean to editorialize, but just to no. sympathize in a way <laughs> with you. You said, it much, you said it much better. All right. Era. Well, hopefully I can find a third way to say it that will uh, be even better than that. But um, So I think um, this is a, a great time to be having this discussion because, as you know, we're ramping up right now for the leaders meeting in Bali. And, um, you know, this is a... This is a pretty important year for APEC in um, in setting, you know, in carrying over some strategy that the U.S. has for that organization. I mean, when we hosted APEC in 2011, we took very seriously what Bob has talked about in terms of the um, success of the technical level work at APEC. You know, when we bring the regulators together or we bring other trade officials together year after year after year, it really does um, promote coherence in the region. But the question was, are we really using that top-level leaders, ministers process as effectively as we can to elevate some of that work and make sure that we're resolving practical issues that impact our companies in the region? And the answer was, we could do a better job. Um, and we could focus more at that top level on solving practical problems. And actually, what we said in 2011, as Matt will recall, is to get stuff done. We could really get stuff done at the leaders and ministers level. Level. That's the PG version. Was yeah. Get there was something else done was the official. Uh, uh, but uh, I have to say that that uh, that saying "get stuff done" has really resonated. I heard Ambassador Froman use it this morning in another context. So it's it's um it's definitely something that has stuck with us. And so in 2011, we were successful at achieving some practical results that we carried on into 2012. Bob alluded to um, you know, our commitment to reduce tariffs on environmental goods. This is the first time in years that any organization has actually made a tariff commitment like this. It's the first time we've ever been able to come up with a list of environmental goods. Um, we've gone way beyond what we were able to do in the WTO. And the reason we were successful in that space and in others is because we took the technical work that we'd been doing for years on environmental goods and, and combined it with the political pressure of leaders and ministers to produce a, a result that was um, easy to understand and would have real benefits for the region, not only in terms of trade, but also in terms of all of our green growth goals. So, you know, leaving, we left 2011 and 2012 and now we're into 2013. I mean, we were very pleased with the Russia host year and that they also took a very practical and substantive approach to their year. They advanced specific issues that they thought were important for the region. For example, they, you know, established um, a new public-private group on innovation and they looked at commercialization of innovative technologies and other things that they think are really important for economic growth. And we supported the their focus on the substance. They stayed away from, um, you know, having a lot of vision statements for how APEC could work, you know, 50 years from now, and just focused on the here and now and solving practical problems. And that's what we also hope to do in the Indonesia year. Um, and so I, when I say it's an important year for APEC, it's important because we need to see the focus on practical issues and resolving problems continue if this organization is going to be able to produce more results like the environmental goods result from last year. Um, so having said that, I guess um, it'll be no surprise to you that we've set out some, you know, some specific trade and investment goals that we'd like to achieve, and I'll go through those. Um, we've welcomed the themes that Indonesia has put forward. Every year there's a new host of APEC, and they, they set out their own themes. Indonesia's are attaining the BOGOR goals, sustainable growth with equity, and promoting connectivity. 
you'll note that their connectivity theme is also being dealt with in the EES, and so you can see how through members there's some synergies between those, um, those groups. Um, but what we at USTR have focused on is mainly the theme of attaining the BOGOR goals and what can we really do to accomplish that. For those of you who don't know, the BOGOR goals are um, free and open trade and investment in the region for developed economies by 2010, so we've passed that, and for all economies by 2020. So I'll just focus on our sort of top level priorities for, um, for Indonesia, but that will give you a sense of the kinds of practical things that we're trying to achieve. I mean, Bob already talked a little bit about our major supply chain ask for leaders when we go to Bali, which is to establish a dedicated fund to enhance supply chain performance um, through targeted and focused capacity building. I mean, APEC has made a lot of commitments on supply chain over the years, but we've set a goal of improving supply chain performance by 10% by 2015. In order to achieve that, we're really going to need to ramp up activity. We're going to need more money and more resources, and we're going to need to bring experts to individual economies to solve specific and practical problems, and that's what the supply chain fund is meant to achieve. Um, we are also um, taking a look at, an, at APEC doing more work on localization. Specifically, we launched an agenda last year to look at the harmful effects of local content requirements and to figure out a way that APEC contribute to addressing those measures. I know a lot of private sector um, folks in the United States at least are very concerned about the proliferation of those measures around the world. We are also at USTR, which is why my title got a little bit longer in the past year. But in APEC, what we're looking to do this year is to agree on a model for how to promote job creation and competitiveness and economic growth without resorting to those kinds of trade distorting measures. This is a very positive contribution that APEC can make by giving um, some high level, you, you know, sort of capacity building to economies on what they can do to create jobs besides things that are going to distort trade and ultimately hurt them in the long run. Um, APEC also has a long agenda on regulatory coherence. Um, we started that in, um, at, a, at a higher level in our host year. This year we're looking to take that forward. We you know, are continuing to work with economies to ensure that they have internal coordination of regulatory work, they're assessing the impact of regulations, and they're conducting public consultations. But we're also going to ask them to start using some more specific tools, such as you know, establishing single online locations for regulatory information, regulatory planning, and periodic regulatory reviews. So this is all pretty, um, pretty wonky stuff, but very, very important for the success of trade and investment in the region to promote regulatory coherence. We're also looking to advance work on to make sure that the innovation policies that APEC economies put in place are um, non-discriminatory market driven. And as Bob mentioned, we are continuing our work to help APEC economies implement that environmental goods tariff commitment, as well as to address non-tariff measures on related to environmental goods and services. And sort of the final priority that I'll mention is, you know, we're getting close to the ninth WTO ministerial meeting, which is also going to be hosted by Indonesia in Bali in December. We, we um, think that the Bali, APEC Bali meetings will actually be a very um, good opportunity for the APEC ministers to come together and hopefully provide some political impetus to a successful result of, what, of the MC9 that definitely includes a binding trade facilitation agreement. And we also hope that APEC ministers and leaders will put a lot of pressure um, you know, on their counterparts to finish an expanded information technology agreement in Bali. So I guess the last thing that I would just say in conclusion, two things about APEC and what all this practical work means. First of all, we think that APEC's ability to focus on solving real problems in creative and innovative ways, because it's a non-binding um, organization, makes a pretty significant contribution to binding negotiations like the TPP. Some of our main priorities in TPP originated in APEC, and, and we are also helping APEC economies who are not members of the TPP negotiations to understand what those nego what kinds of issues would be addressed there and to prepare them for one day being able to sign on to those negotiations. And so that, in that sense, APEC is playing a very powerful role in, um, in trade and investment issues outside its own um, agreement, its, its own meetings. 
And then finally, you know, we um, are still very much committed to the Bogor goals of achieving free trade and investment, um, free and open trade and investment by 2020. I mean, that when that when that goal was first established, I think a lot of people thought, well, that's a long time from now, 2020, and it's really not that long now. And the definition of what free and open trade and investment means, you know, expands every day. But it's been a very useful organizing tool for APEC, and I think for all of us who are interested in promoting trade and investment in the region. So thank you. Thank you, Arrow. Um, uh, I understand much better what we're trying to get out of this year and, and going forward, so that's extremely helpful, and I want to come back and ask you about um, uh, about next year, but, but we'll come back. Uh, Michael. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and I'm, I'm extremely gratified to see that there's such a broad interest in this um, topic. Uh, we know as well as, as, uh, as was said that APIC is very deep and very broad. It can sometimes be hard to get your, your hand on what's going on, and I'm very happy to give my, my input from a Treasury side, uh, which I think was alluded to, um, doesn't have the highest profile in the sense of what's going on in the leader's process, what's going on in the ministerial process, but yet does retain for the finance ministry is a very important part in international collaboration, and for the Treasury Department, it's a very important vehicle for us to engage with, um, with Asia as well as Pan-Pacific, but it's uh, what we think about APEC is especially focused on uh, what's happening in Asia. Now, I can continue the theme that was set out before about the utility of APEC being for uh, broader consultation, making sure that we're on the same wavelength uh, as our, as our uh, other economies, and then the practical aspects of how these economies get together and work on common issues. So our finance ministerial will be next week, and the practical, I'll start, I'll start with the easy parts in a sense, the, the practical outcomes that we're doing are very much a, a follow-through from some of the ideas that the United States put on the table when we had the host here back in 2011. We're working on things like infrastructure financing, and this is like the development of public-private partnerships for infrastructure, which is a way for us to share knowledge and us to learn what's happening in the region as a number of these countries are struggling uh, to get private infrastructure, both infrastructure in general and private infrastructure off the ground. We've been sort of working on a theme for the last couple of years, which is, which is a statement that we know that there are deep pools of capital in the world, and we know that that capital would like to go to things like uh, toll roads and fast-growing emerging markets. And we know that these same emerging markets are stretched on their budgets and would like to have that private capital. So it seems like a match made in heaven, and yet many times these deals don't happen. And there's some general principles that you can talk about amongst different countries, and there's some practical issues that are very country specific, how the Philippines deals with it is very different than Malaysia, which is useful uh, to collaborate amongst the different, uh, the different group of, groups of experts. And if there was not APEC, then there would be uh, an absence of this kind of cooperation. So that's one important thing. There's another theme this year which is called financial inclusion. Again, it's something the United States takes uh, very seriously. And a number of emerging markets that are APEC members also, it's like number one on what their leaders talk about the need to uh, address some of the poverty issues and development issues by providing uh, credit to residents and to SMEs that didn't have it before. And there's a huge potential for learning from each other, uh, although conditions in the United States are, of course, quite different than they are in a Peru or, a, or uh, in Indonesia. There's a surprising amount of, of uh, commonalities and a good opportunity for learning together. So this is the way that the, that the Treasury and the other Treasuries in the region sort of collaborate on a, on a practical, fruitful, technical way. On the bigger picture, APEC is still a channel that we see for um, collaboration on macroeconomic and global financial policy. And I can put APEC against uh, G20. People know that the G20 has existed for some time and it became the, the main vehicle for international collaboration for the global financial crisis. And if you think APEC does not have Europeans in it, and the, and the uh, ministerial con uh, consultations are for finance ministers. They're not finance ministers and central banks. So it leads to a different focus in the nature of these consultations, where, for better or worse, no Europe means that there hasn't been the, 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 the intense um, focus of G20 on uh, ensuring that Europe grows out of its problems of the last few years. The dialogue in APEC has been more free to focus on uh, sustainable growth in the region, what the Treasury Departments call uh, rebalancing. It's a bit different than what uh, Scott Marcial called call the rebalancing in Asia. But rebalancing in, in, uh, in countries' current accounts, we're uh, concerned about 
the accumulation of reserves, uh, the right valuation for, uh, for currencies as they relate to foreign trade, and issues like this. So APIC provides us a really good opportunity at the finance level to delve into those issues in more detail. And uh, next week, uh, this is going to be very much a theme for the consultations to be held. Of course, the, uh, if you were to think back to the last year's conversations and how the world was at the time, and think about how we are today, it's, an, it's, a, it's a useful and a necessary opportunity for the finance ministers, the heads of delegation, to check in with each other. So I know Matt is, is trying to think of some zinger questions for me about the, the growth, growth issues, but I'll just sort of highlight some, some factors. You know, in the last year, China's had a slowdown. People are still wondering about how far it will slow down, uh, what is the nature of its stabilization. That has a huge impact on countries in Southeast Asia. It has a huge impact, of course, on, on our own economy and on Latin America. Commodity prices, for example, in line with Chinese slowdown, have fallen very significantly. So uh, if you are a commodity exporter, you're in Indonesia, you're in Malaysia, you're in Latin America, then this is going to have, it's going to have, it has had, and will have a significant impact on your current account and on your growth, right? The latest news is that, uh, is that economies that are more advanced, the United States, uh, Japan, um, Europe, also are doing a bit better than they were doing before. And this has an impact on how investors allocate their capital around the world. So there's, a, there's definitely a change in the theme of the conversation. Last year, a few years before that, it was APEC was the place where you had to be because that's where the growth is. That's where the, the young people are. That's the dynamism in the global economy. You have to put your money there. And you know, to the extent that is still true, the latest news is it's a bit less true than it was before. And so we've seen a number of uh, market dynamics in, in Southeast Asia, for example, where investors are reevaluating whether or not that story that they had, the sort of the, the theme of the way they were thought about uh, global growth, whether or not that's still intact. And if it's not intact, what does it mean? So um, whether or not countries are dependent on foreign capital or not, whether or not they are dependent on exports or not, there's a process now that's going on in markets uh, about how investors should think about these issues. And finance ministers, when they get together to have these conversations, you can bet that that's going to be uh, front and center on their, on, their, on their plate for discussion. And so uh, APEC continues to provide this vehicle for the United States to engage and to engage in Asia as an as a open architecture concept. It's not the ASEAN plus three, which doesn't include the United States and doesn't include uh, members that are not in the ASEAN plus three. It's an opportunity for us to go there. We get to talk to them directly, and they get to hear from us directly, both at the level of the heads of delegation and the ministers, and then we have meetings during the year to share our perspectives. And so it's a very rich um, avenue for collaboration. Treasury is not a program agency, so people want to ask, what is the rebalance to Asia, or what is the pivot to Asia? What does it have to do with, with economics? You know, we don't come with many new uh, deliverables on the Treasury side. Our answer to this says, well, have you noticed we're doing the Trans-Pacific Partnership? That's sort of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and we like, to remind the, we, we like to remind people that the United States FDI in Asia is uh, bigger than China, Japan, Australia, you know, combined. We're still huge. The stock of our economic stake in that region is enormous. And so APEC provides us the vehicle where we can continue to have these important policy consultations with the region and advance the United States um, economic interest. So I can finish there. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. And I now realize I'm not going to be able to ask all the questions I want to ask, including the ones I promised to ask. Um, so uh, hopefully some others in the audience are going to pick up on some of this. But I think we've just got a lot of rich food for thought there. And I, I want to start by asking a question really of everybody, but um, maybe starting with Tanaka-san, Michael will have a view on this. I mean, we, you've all been talking fairly comfortably about the notion of doing APEC over here and doing EAS over there and doing G20 in a third place, um, but it feels kind of, to an outsider, like uh, this is pretty messy, and it feels as though, uh, especially if you've got OCD tendencies, that there ought to be some way to sort of bring this stuff together and make it a little neater. I mean, I guess the, the, the question is, are there, in a practical sense, Tanaka-san, when you're doing work in APEC and EAS back-to-back, uh, -back, places where the two forums are 
you know, doing things differently, incompatibly, where you have to sort of say, well, gosh, we don't know which way we should go with these things, and, and where there might be some room for trying to make all of this a little more efficient and um, cleaner? Well, uh, I don't think there's any uh, clear-cut, uh, you know, uh, answers to these type of questions. Uh, uh, I think in reality, uh, what, what I sensed uh, when I was doing th these kind of things in several forums was that since the task was so big and there were so many things that had to be done, uh, before we were too worried about, you know, uh, overlaps of any efforts, uh, I always felt that, you know, uh, we were still lacking uh, in terms of resource and everything and uh, how we can tackle all of these things. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think, you know, coordination in each government and also uh, uh, with other governments is done much more than people believe them to be actually taking place. And, uh, and also, uh, as long as we share the, the basic directions or the goals, uh, I don't think that uh, that seriously, pro you know, uh, brings about, you know, uh, problems. But, but of course, uh, we, uh, we always have to be mindful that, uh, you know, uh, that kind of, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, inconsistencies or s some sort of you know clashes uh, among the forums could happen so uh, uh, we have to watch out but but my experience was not so serious in that regard in my case mm -hmm. tensions between these different groups that not just I mean there's clearly a capacity tension and and particularly for the US government with the sequester and things, and you know, I actually was going to uh, read out some fun facts about USTR's budget and how much it's been. The, the sequestration savings, the sequestration savings at the at the USTR on a monthly basis are less than it costs to purchase a Taco Bell franchise in Maryland, according to the Center for American Progress. So it's sort of trivial. What is, being, what is being cut, and yet it's really impacting their work because they can't travel, they can't, you know, uh, attend these different things. So they're clearly capacity issues, and if people want to speak to that, they can. But I really was interested more kind of from, from a policy perspective whether there are, you know, there are conflicts when you go into these different groupings. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll just answer really briefly. I think our main concern at USTR in that regard is that we, is that if you spread out the conversation, um, you know, on certain topics too, sort of too broadly. I mean, if you spread it out broadly, there's both benefits and downside to it. I think the benefit is that you reach more people and so you can kind of uh, influence more people in a, in a policy direction. But the downside is that you might water down any one individual activity. And so when we look at the, the various agendas, we do try to eliminate um, duplication to the extent we can. But I would agree with uh, Tanaka-san that it's not been so far a significant problem for us. But we, we keep a very close watch on it. Sorry, thank you, Ernie. Um, which is um, maybe the more positive side of, of this question, which is the, the positive um, uh, repercussions or, or overlap or spillovers that one organization may have on another. And I'm wondering in particular with TPP, at least possibly within reach uh, this year or, or, or very soon uh, thereafter, um, there's sort of a feeling that it's starting to infect other um, parts of the um, architecture discussions, like bilateral FTAs between Korea and China. We heard some reference uh, to uh, the Koreans saying the Chinese are taking a somewhat more uh, sort of a higher standard approach to, 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 that, to, to that negotiation. China is now interested in doing a high standard bit with the United States. Um, I, I wanted, again, to, to not put the burden on Tanaka-san again, but when you're now working on the EU-Japan FTA, is, is some of your, now that you're in TPP and working on standards there, higher standards um, there, is that having a, an effect on what your, your negotiating position is with the EU? Or in RCEP, that was the other one, I mean, is, is, there, is the conversation sort of changing because of the dynamics in the, in the TPP in particular? Well, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, we're living in an era of uh, mega FTAs, uh, EU-Japan, TPIP, TPIP, uh, TPP, RCEP. Uh, of course, not all negotiations are, you know, achieving or trying to aim at the same kind of level. Uh, 
of liberalization, but still, uh, uh, it's clear that you know all these you know negotiations are sort of uh, boosting each other, you know, helping each other in a sense. And uh, actually, it's 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 uh, we, I've seen more positive, you know, uh, sides of positive effects of you know movements of any negotiation on the others, uh, especially TPP, since it's it, it seems to be very close to its goal compared to the others. Uh, I'm sure that you know, and I have also felt uh, literally that you know it, it has you know uh, uh, put a very positive you know uh, uh, pressure on the other negotiations and uh, especially on on things that are being negotiated among the developed world. I think more and more I see more and more convergence of in agendas or the way uh, that we want these negotiations to achieve uh, being more aligned uh, with uh, one uh, one uh, against the other. That's what I feel. Could I add something? Yeah, sure. Uh, on this point, uh, I understand that, of course, you have RCEP with the ASEAN plus six, and then you have TPP. But uh, on this point, I think not only is it just a matter of pressure, but I think uh, the fact that you have so many FTAs and RTAs running around you know, the, the field, uh, it's, it's sort of good to actually also, and the Chinese have actually sort of uh, talk to me about this in, in very general terms, of looking at best practices in, in some ways, you could call it that way. In other words, you look at transparency in how TPP deals with certain services sectors or other kinds of sectors, agricultural sectors or whatnot, then you might talk about how RCEP approaches that or how Co Chorus does that. So comparison of notes, uh, you might say, on how these negotiate, transparency essentially, on how these processes deal with different issues can be actually synergetic in terms of informing others as to, and future FTAs, in terms of how to proceed on these issues, what to worry about, and how to do it. So I think, I think something positive actually can come out of it, although obviously there are lots of these things running around. Michael, in that regard, um, let, me, uh, let me make you uncomfortable by asking about the uh, EAS uh, finance agenda, because Treasury has, or the United States government has chosen not to really engage in that, although I guess you did deliver the secretary once, twice now, uh, to, to an EAS finance minister's meeting. Um, but, um, but I would think that there would be some value, even if, I understand capacity constraints again, so that's a, that may be a real issue. But in substantive terms, I would think there would be some value in your engaging on the finance agenda and helping to make some of those positive um, spillovers, as it were, from other efforts you're doing in the G20 or APEC finance ministers or um, other places. When within the EAS, there is a this ASEAN plus three um, kind of uh, uh, effort as well, and you know, not all of that, as you say, you're not part of that. Um, you might want to help be part of that conversation indirectly by by engaging more on the EAS finance uh, agenda. How how do you answer that? Well, thank you. You, <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't make me uncomfortable at all. I think um, I can come back to a point that that you were raising before about the. Um, the uh, overlap between the different forums that are out there and uh, whether or not agencies have enough uh, bandwidth to do all this stuff. When I was speaking, I mentioned the difference between APEC and the G20 was the fact that there were no Europeans. In that case, there were no uh, central banks. And uh, the creation of the East Asia Summit, which was done primarily for sort of political or political security issues, you know, the sp special focus there you know, makes sense. But in which way would the East Asia Summit for finance uh, be different than APEC. This is the challenge that we have. In theory, uh, we think it's it's great. It sounds great, right? Um, but in in practice, I've identified the kind of conversation that we'll be having at APEC next week. Uh, in which way would the East Asia Summit discussion be different? So we would we would add India. We would add the small ASEAN members who are not currently in APEC. We would lose Latin America. Uh, Canada, I think. Uh, so there would be a different conversation. Would it be that different of a conversation? There would be something there. And in fact, we're not by any stretch opposed to the East Asia Summit. I think you were characterizing why don't we engage much more. It's because we really sit down and say, you know, given our limitations, the time it takes to do these things, the actual outcome which we can accomplish, and what we're trying to do in these fora, um, does it really, is it really there? And we have given a lot of thought, as of other members in the East Asia Summit, uh, in that community, that group of, of, of countries, what can we do to make this a really value-added enterprise? 
that would justify the finance ministers getting on planes again. And, um, and we're still thinking actively about that. Okay. But if there's another meeting, then we're, we're not opposed to that meeting. We're just trying to think, you know, how does this really work? Okay, just one more question, then I'll open to the floor, which is um, starting with Bob, but then, you know, Arrow, I want your thoughts, and Tanaka-san as well. Um, so China's hosting APEC next year. Um, China has actually traditionally been in these forums pretty constructive as a host because it wants to, you know, it wants to show that it can it can manage a, an, an event that people uh, not only think is has nice pictures with people in shirts, but but actually gets things done. So, what are your expectations, Did Bob? Before you left, were were they already starting to talk about their APEC year? Do you have any sense of what they want to accomplish? And more specifically, Arrow, what would we like to see China do next year? Um, and, and but let me make one mic before I, because I want to have another chance to speak, uh, just another advertisement for our paper that Scott Miller alluded to at the beginning of the um, session this morning, if you weren't here, uh, this paper, working paper, which we're uh, soliciting comments and input on, um, on enhancing value chains and agenda for APEC uh, next year, which um, I'm, Scott and his panel coming up is going to talk more about, so I won't get into it, but I just wanted to throw that ad out there. I won't go into details, but the first thing I actually the Chinese uh, told me um, before I left Beijing was that they were actually very interested in the topic we were just discussing, which is, the, they call it convergence. I know Arrow will cringe when we call it, converg call it convergence, but the convergence between TPP and RCEP. Now, you take away the word convergence, what they're interested in, the number one thing is just to look at the two and just say, see, essentially, as you, all of you know, the initial reaction to this by Ch to the TPP by China was that they thought this was excluding China, this was a Cold War, this was this and that. But they've come around at least to the fact that they're actually are looking at this and saying maybe there's something to be learned from what's going on. And of course they're working on RCEP as well, which is a very difficult process too. But I think that's one of the things they discussed uh, as something they'd like to focus on uh, in 2014. The other thing that is sort of unique, besides, the other two are not that unique, connectivity, sustained growth, that's what we've been doing. So n nothing really new there. But apart from that, they're sort of looking now at what they call oceans uh, ministerial, which is uh, focusing a little bit on the merit, some of the maritime issues that would include transportation, mining, conservation, whatnot. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at, at this po possible proposal and see whether or not, um, oh, and health? Okay, she said health too. That's for you, not for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so, but this is the, the, the this, this side of it. And health is, of course, an, an issue that they're very interested in, having had SARS in 2003, uh, a lot of problems there in, in China with food safety and, and whatnot. So uh, clearly another, another focus. What I'd like to focus on, um, again, you, you probably got already a sense of that, is anti-corruption and the legal system. I would really like to push that uh, in China in 2014. I haven't discussed it with our my counterparts yet, uh, my interagency, but I think the sort of building of a solid, sort of more, a more solid legal system uh, in China and within the APEC community should be a priority that we can get started in 2014. Thanks. Um, well, I guess the first thing I would say is that we would like China to continue with this, the approach that we've been taking in APEC over the past few years and to try to achieve some practical results on trade and investment. I mean, that, that is our number one priority. Um, you know, what specific practical results we'll achieve, I think, will have to be worked out between, um, you know, among all the APEC economies, and certainly we want to work closely with China to figure out specific asks of APEC um, that fit within what China itself is interested in. And some of the things that they've talked about, um, you know, that they have specific interest in that we've seen over the past couple of months include, as, as Bob said, they, they really want to look at transparency and RTAs, FTAs. APEC has been doing, um, has had an agenda on this over the past few years, and I think they want to ramp that up. And, we're supportive about, you know, of having more transparency, and I think Bob's right that that is a shift for them, and we welcome it. Um, they also want to look at global value chains, so that so listen very carefully to the next panel because I think we'll maybe they'll give some good ideas for what we can funnel to the Chinese. They've made a proposal on, you know, related to investment. We don't know much details about that, but it's not surprising to us that they're interested in that topic. 
Um, and then we're just, you know, there's obviously a supply chain will have to be a really big focus because, you know, we're successful in getting a tra trade facilitation agreement in the WTO. We're coming upon APEC's own goal of enhancing supply chain performance. We're looking for APEC to do bigger things, and I, I think the Chinese are really supportive of that. So, so bottom line, to continue the practical effects, but um, in areas that mean something for all of our stakeholders would be what we want. Okay, thanks. And, and you know, I should have said that, and I guess it was alluded to um, by several people, but uh, that, that this um, issue with APEC of having a host, a new host every year, um, which is, uh, you know, broadly a good thing, does pose challenges in terms of uh, keeping the existing agenda moving forward and reinforcing the things that were done. So it works best, say, what we, you know, we got in 2011 on environmental goods and services, which was the basic commitment to, to lower tariffs by 2015, and then the Russians took that forward and came up with a list of products that would be subject to that. I mean, and there are other examples in regulatory convergence and innovation and others that have been talked about. That's um, a really critical uh, balance that you have to get of putting in new ideas, and you want hosts to do that, and inevitably they'll want to, but you, you want to carry forward the good work that's been done already, and um, so I certainly hope the Chinese are going to do that. Um, okay, I've taken more than my share of the time. Let me open the floor to questions. As usual, uh, wait for the microphone. Please identify yourself and, and ask a question. There's a hand right there. Hi, thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm Melinda St. Louis from Public Citizen. Um, my question is uh, related to what many of the panelists spoke about, uh, the TPP being an important priority for APEC and, and in the coming years for other countries to be able to join it. My question is specifically, though, about what the the timeline for the conclusion of the current negotiations, understanding um, that it's been laid out for the end of the year, and the how current uh, controversial issues could be resolved uh, for that, um, and particularly since Japan has just was only at the table for one round, full round so far. And since there, we have officials from Japan and the U.S. here. Specifically, the question, one question I would have is about the thorny issue of the five sacred commodities that have been laid out by the Japanese uh, majority LDP party. And so the question is, is it likely that the U.S. would allow Japan to exclude rice, wheat and barley, pork and beef, sugar and dairy from TPP tariff reductions? And if not, uh, if Prime Minister Abe is likely to uh, contradict those conditions to seal a deal. Thank you. Or a U.S. answer, or <laughs> both. <laughs> you want to start to sure, sure. and then Arrow can boldly try. Well, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not directly in charge of uh, TPP, so I'll uh, uh, I'll have to limit my comments to just just what's been already uh, spoken uh, officially. You know, uh, Japan is a uh, has participated in TPP and is a uh, well uh, clearly a strong supporter of the success. And uh, that's it. Uh, well, uh, I, I know what you want to hear, but uh, I, 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 unfortunately, I have no ability to add anything or distract anything from what I just said. I hope it's going to be concluded uh, satisfactorily. Thank you. Um, I'm going to say the same thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that my colleague at USTR, Barbara Weisel, would be more than happy to, and as Wendy Cutler, would be happy to answer those questions. Um, I'm going to say that, you know, TPP uh, leaders instructed negotiators to try to finish the deal this year, but we're going to, you know, the substance of the negotiation will drive the timeline, and, and obviously um, all key issues will need to be resolved in order to conclude. We, you know, it is very tempting to do TPP here, but we're we're sort of um, focused in a different direction. We do have a series that Ernie and Scott run on on TPP, and so stay tuned because we will have those questions and hopefully answers uh, for you soon. Uh, other questions? Yes, ma'am. Very much. I go back to the uh, point that. Mr. Wang brought... Just identify yourself. Yes, this is Chin Ning Wen, good voice of Vietnamese Americans. I go back to the point that Mr. Wang brought up about anti-corruption. You said that would be the main focus in 2014. Actually, it would be the main focus for anything that we want to do forward. Uh, anti-corruption and the legal framework. Where do you see we are now and what you're hoping to achieve in Southeast Asia 
in ASEAN, especially in Vietnam, what can we do to support you in that mission? I, actually, I was being a little presumptuous because um, we haven't really talked interagency and with the Chinese yet, so I, I don't know. Of course, normally the host country uh, is the country or economy, sorry. Host economy is the one that really in many ways shape things, of course, working with the rest of us. But I think, uh, first of all, I think the anti-corruption theme is going to be actually fairly popular in China, interestingly, because as you know, uh, there are things going on in China that are, are very interesting domestically. But, uh, and also we, no, we now have more and more cases, for example, of um, foreign, so-called so foreign bribery uh, cases where uh, foreign companies have been charged, uh, sometimes detained, put in prison. Uh, so I think one of the themes that we'll move forward on, if, if we do, is probably the, the whole question of foreign and domestic bribery as a theme that we can discuss in China and begin to at least look at the cases and then look at proper sort of business ethics. Uh, we've already actually been working on that already with the SME working group, where we have SME working on business ethics. Uh, and then we'll probably try to expand that. But I think the first focus will be, my guess, on these kinds of cases. But again, beyond that, I really don't know because I haven't really developed it. But I'm just basically of the belief that for any sustainable economic development, you have to have the proper legal system. And it, it works well with the good regulatory practices as well. But beyond that, without that, it's not sustainable in the future. So I think that's something we need to work on. Uh, in an early Ernie Bauer with uh, CSIS, in an early, early, earlier panel, we talked about the link between economic uh, integration and security. Uh, how do you guys think about that? Do you, would you agree with the premise that the security panel came up with, which was that it's absolutely fundamental, that link? And then in, in that sense, how, how can you, um, is, is overlapping architecture just fine? You know, so you, I think you've made the case that APEC is, is doing great things at a technical and a sort of tactical level. Is, is APEC strategic? Um, you know, shouldn't APEC include all of the ASEAN members and in India um, if, if that's the geostrategic footprint? And I hate to, to go back to this. I know, you know we heard um, other views this morning, but I'd like to hear uh, the, from your panel's point of view. Um, I, I guess my question for the Americans would be, can we sit out of uh, RCEP? Or should there be a way to have the Americans at the table at RCEP? And should, shouldn't uh, anyone who's in the EAS be able to have some linkage and a sort of eyes in and a, and a channel if they so wanted uh, to join TPP? Several questions embedded in there. Some of them uh, I think were touched on, but if, I don't know, Tanakasan, you mentioned the link between economics and security, and uh, do others want to sort of emphasize that? And Bob, you might also pick up on the, the membership question, uh, which is a sensitive one, but, um, or a tricky one. Uh, it's not sensitive, it's just it's tricky. Uh, um, uh, either of you want to <laughs> take a stab? Sure. Well, I actually I want to sort of, uh, answer the first one as well, uh, just very quickly. I've al already alluded to that, because I, in my own sort of simple vision, is I see uh, APEC as a, not just, again, a clearly very important market opening, trade investment, but all of that is for some purpose. Prosperity, of course, and then gradually integration. And so I, when I see APEC 50 years from now, I do see um, APC, Asia Pacific Community. Now, I'm not going to be around to see it, but that, that's what I see. And so I think the answer is clearly the implication of security as well. Because when you meet together, you work together on all these different issues at the working level, at the higher level, at some point, uh, conflicts over territorial issues become, you, know, you, don't, you don't just go ahead and kill each other right away. <laughs> Okay, I mean, it, it does, it is, it is a, I think it is a strategic view of mine that this is what's happening. But uh, that was my answer. On the, on the membership, I think I'll let Arrow do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 I mean, 
let me press arrow also just to not not <laughs> no i mean i'm trying to deflect it i'm trying to deflect it in, in a way i mean the membership you can address that how you want but i mean i think the rcep question is a is a is a real one too which is you know why can't the u.s you know engage more in the rcep conversation um on the trade side and the finance side i sort of have touched on with michael but i'd welcome further thoughts on that Sorry. Well, first of all, on membership uh, of APEC, um, you know, I guess the question about whether or not you need members is dependent on what you really want to do with APEC. And our focus in APEC is to sort of strengthen and, and deepen the existing um, regional economic integration rather than trying to broaden it. We think APEC, the way it stands now, is a really unique organization where you can take on cutting edge issues. All the members have demonstrated to one extent or another their commitment to free and open trade and investment and therefore it's a very useful organization for us. If you were to look to open membership, um, you know, you've got about a dozen additional countries that would like to become APEC economies. That, that changes the nature of the organization significantly, and then we lose something very valuable to us. And I think Bob's right that, you know, we're advanced, trying to resolve and address barriers to trade and investment, but we're also trying to promote economic growth and prosperity. And then we did, you know, even in our own host year, talk about how a vision for an Asia-Pacific community is out there, but we think that you need to deepen before you, you broaden. On the question of RCEP, um, you know, this isn't, um, you know, our focus is on getting a TPP agreement negotiated. We think that bringing, you know, we think that all of these agreements can exist out there. Um, they're not mutually exclusive. All of our members, members of APEC and the WTO, some are members of Pacific Alliance, some are working on RCEP. We're focused on a high quality agreement in TPP, and we think that that is the best way to put our energies forward. So. Uh, Guan Lu from University of Virginia. Um, I would like to know your perspective on the financial architecture in East Asia. Given that, I think I see the three factors happening now, which may actually affect the economic stability in emerging market in South and the Southeast Asia. Now, um, one is like the tempering, you know, of the uh, U.S. Uh, physical stimulus, and another one is the, the potential uh, China's economic slowdown, and also the rising China's uh, currency, renminbi, as an alternative, you know, um, uh, you know, international currency now in Asia. So uh, I would like to know, you know, how would the U.S. and Japan to deal with and manage the potential another, you know, like a, you know, rising inst instability. Um, on the financial aspect, uh, given that we all know that the EAS, EAS was the product of the, the regional financial crisis in 1997. So I would like to know you, uh, your perspective on the promoting the financial integration or you know, architecture in, in East Asia. Thank you. Michael, you want to <laughs> try at that? There were a few things embedded in that as well. I, I mean, there are questions of, I mean, I think one question is about financial, how you see financial stability right now in the region and whether U.S. tapering or China's slowdown or other factors are, are creating new risks there, um, or India and Indo Indo Indonesia, as Goldman calls it, uh, their, their struggles. Um, you know, is that creating new, and then, and then that's sort of one part, is it creating new instabilities and risks? And then, you know, what is the agenda, you know, for financial, uh, financial integration and reform going forward? I think those were kind of. Well, thanks, and I tried to get at this in part in, in the in the comments that I made. Uh, so I'd like not, not like to say that there's a new risk per se, uh, but there's certainly market. Uh, you know, markets are falling in different parts of the world, um, and it's a it's an issue that the policymakers are clearly worried about, and this is what we'll be discussing when we go next week. So the the topics are out there, and the purpose of the architecture that we have, whether it's G20 or whether or not it's APEC, is to allow the, the policymakers to engage with, with each other to make sure that they have open lines of communication and, and understanding of facts and each other's perspectives, uh, which is um, one of the main utilities of having these kinds of, of meetings. In terms of uh, financial integration, I mean, as a 
matter of perspective, we think that's a good thing. We think that a number of these countries in Southeast Asia or Asia more generally have clearly benefited from uh, free flow of capital, open investment. This is, I think, almost a matter of, of, uh, of faith for us. Uh, and I would end by saying that in contrast to the emerging market crisis of the late 90s, one of the positive things you can see uh, is that um, uh, most of those economies are, are much stronger than they were at the time. You don't see countries uh, uh, spending the reserves dramatically defend, to defend over valued exchange rates, for example. Um, buffers are stronger than they were. Fiscal positions are stronger than they were in a relative sense. So while um, much of this region, Southeast Asia in particular, Latin America, is coming off of very, very good times in terms of the easy availability of capital, um, these are issues that, uh, that, that if the policymakers are, are watching and thinking concretely what they should do, uh, they should be able to manage through. So we all have to collaborate closely together, and I'm sure that we will. Great. Again, another topic for another uh, CSAS conference. We, we need to do something on, on this whole question set of questions. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to end it there, but I'm going to end again with an ad or an editorial on a subject that is related to stuff that we got done in uh, 2011. Uh, you three don't, aren't responsible for this, but when you talk to your colleagues at the Customs and Border Patrol or Homeland Security uh, folks, and maybe they're watching online, I want you to tell them that, we, that when we uh, at the CEO Summit in Hawaii in 2011, the president was applauded three times when he got on the stage and when he left the stage and when he said that he had just signed the legislation enacting the APEC business travel card. And he got a huge round of applause from the business community in the room. And we're here two years later, and that card has still not been issued because the, <laughs> the, the implementing regs have not been passed. And everybody in this room has a stake in it because you can claim you're a business person, get this card, and you get free act. I mean, you get, um, uh, uh, you get diplomat treatment entering uh, any APEC economy. Uh, and don't have to wait in line. So uh, tell your CPB <laughs> colleagues that they need to get those implementing regs done. We need some capacity building. <laughs> all right, it sounds like it. All right, thank you all very much, and uh, the next panel will follow.